Sheltering in place, we're sheltering in God. It is September 20th, week 27. Do you ever feel a bit discontent, restless, looking for something more? Peter isn't quite happy with his lot in life in today's text. And he asks Jesus, he wonders if maybe the 12 will end up with more. You know, after all, they're the special students. And Jesus sees a deeper problem. He's like, Peter, are are you envious? Is that what's going on here? You're looking around and you always want just a little bit more. Is that what's going on here? You always want just a little more. Yeah, a common problem, I think. I think many of us will relate to Peter this morning. The text is Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. The Gospel reading today is from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired at about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Good morning, children of St. Luke's. When I was younger, my dad used to give my brother and my sisters and I an allowance every week if we did our chores. We would wash the car, pull weeds, that kind of stuff, but we only got our allowance when the work was done. Now, when you grow up and you get a job, the same thing applies. You earn pay for the work that you do, for the hours that you work. So in this parable, we hear that the vineyard owner, who represents God, paid everybody the same wage, even when they didn't work the same hours. Some of them only worked a couple hours, and some worked all day, but he paid them all the same amount. I didn't think that was very fair, do you? The good news is that God is not fair. He's gracious. Remember what grace is? We can remind ourselves by using this acronym for the letters of the word G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Because if God was fair, we would have to earn grace. But instead, he gave us his son, Jesus, to die on the cross to take the punishment for us. That was grace. I, for one, am glad God is not fair. He is better than fair. If we trust God, we don't get what we deserve. We get what we cannot earn, and that is eternal life. So let's pray and thank God for that. Dear God, thank you for keeping our family and friends safe and healthy. Thank you for the gift of grace, and thank you that if we trust God, we will all have eternal life. Amen. I don't know if you've ever had days when you are discontent with your lot in life. Uh, You look around you and you think, 
There's got to be something more than this. Surely there's something more. Have you ever felt that way? It's, um, I think it's quite common. It's a feeling of wanting more. It's a feeling of, oh, is this all there is? I think it's a common experience. You know, it's maybe, it could be wanting someone else's life or looking at other people and wishing you had something they had or, and, or it could be this way. Maybe at your core, you are quite a contented person, but you have someone in your life that is envious of you. Have you ever experienced that? You have someone in your life who, for whatever reason, they're envious of you. Well, if you do, chances are that relationship is pretty tricky to navigate. It's very difficult to have a relationship with that kind of uh, energy in, in the relationship. With envy, there's always something missing. There's always something wrong, um, something that, that could be better. And with envy, the attention is always placed on what is missing. So it's always about what could be better and what I don't have. Uh, and again, it could be a physical thing, it could be something like money or possessions, or it could be creativity or someone's intellectual capacity. It could be someone's success, it could be someone's family life or their children. It could be, um, well actually you can be envious of anything, the green-eyed monster, right? You could be envious of anything. and. It, it, can, it can take over a life. It really can just take over your whole life. Well, I wonder if Peter, the disciple, was having a little bit of a day of discontent when he asked Jesus this question. He asked him, and this is the just the chapter before this parable that you just heard. This is kind of the setup for the parable. Peter said, um, Jesus, you know, what, what is in this for us? I mean, like more. Are we going to get anything more? And it's the idea of, Jesus, you know, we, we're your 12, right? I mean, we're the special ones. We've given up everything. We're really committed. I mean, much more than everyone else. So will we get a little bit more? Will we end up getting some kind of, I think he's looking for rewards, basically. He's looking for the idea that Jesus is going to say, yeah, because you're special and because you're with me all the time and because you're the 12, um, yeah, you're, you're going to get a lot more and this is what it looks like. Of course, Jesus doesn't answer that way. Not that that will surprise you, right? You know, Jesus, he always pinpoints the heart of the matter and he zeroes in on the real problem. And the real problem is, uh, he kind of looks below the surface of Peter's question and Peter's saying, are we going to end up getting more? We're going to end up with something special because we're the part of your inner group. He looks below the surface of that question and he sees envy. He sees in Peter envy. He senses in Peter a sense that, Peter, I think you're maybe looking around and, and wishing you had something that you don't have. What is it? Why, why are you asking me for more? You must be looking around you or looking at someone or looking at something and wishing that you had that, otherwise you wouldn't be asking me about what more you're going to get. Peter, there's got to be a discontentment in there. And if there's a discontentment in there, there's a chance that envy's in there. And then he goes on to give the parable that we've just heard. Envy is an interesting one because, you know, people will tell you about all sorts of weaknesses and all sorts of frailties 
uh, but you'll rarely ever hear someone admit to being envious. They'll say that they have trouble with anger, or they'll say, oh, I'm really impatient, or I'm bossy, but envy? No, you'll very, very, very rarely hear, I don't even know if I've ever actually heard anyone say, uh, I'm, I'm an envious person. I think, um, I think there's maybe a bit of embarrassment about it, for the most part. I mean, yes, you do, there are people that will tell you openly, but for the most part, people are very hesitant to, to, to admit to envy. Nobody bothers if you say, you know, I'm a controlling person or, but envy tends to be hidden. It tends to be a character uh, problem that, that's, that's hidden. And yet it's very, very common. Otherwise, why would the Ten Commandments have two of the commandments all about coveting, which is all about wanting what someone else has? So if you've got two commandments that cover this problem, that must be, that must be quite a big problem. Maybe it's a bigger problem than we realize. I mean, maybe we don't even know that we're moving in places where we're, you know, moving into that place of, of envy. Maybe we're not always aware of it. But it's just interesting that two of the commandments talk about envy. So here's the parable. The parable is a landowner went out to hire grape pickers early in the morning and promised to pay him the usual daily wage, verse 2. Everybody's happy with that. They're getting the normal, usual daily wage. They go out to the fields and they work. At about nine o'clock, the, the landowner goes out again and says, um, I'll hire you if you're, if you're interested. Yes, we're interested off the nine o'clock or so. He goes out again at uh, noon and at three and at five. So five o'clock's pretty late, isn't it? It's pretty late in the day. And he says to each group of people who he hires, I'll pay you what's right. So off they all go. And the five o'clockers obviously have quite a short day. The end of the day comes and the early morning workers got paid the wage that they agreed upon. And then the 12 o'clockers got paid, and then the three o'clockers got paid, and then the five o'clockers got paid, but everyone is paid the same, even the five o'clockers, who didn't do that much work compared to the people that came really early in the morning. Now, the people who came first thing in the morning look at their check and it's like, that's not fair. That's not fair, they said, verse 12. You made these five o'clockers equal to us. You paid them the same. We've been here since early, early in the morning. We've been slogging away in the hot sun, in the scorching heat. We've been picking your grapes. You give us this wage, and then these five o'clockers come in at the last minute. You give them the same wage. The landowner says, I didn't, I didn't do you any wrong. You agreed upon a wage, a fair wage. And I said, great, let's go for it. I didn't do you any wrong at all. I gave you the wage that we both agreed upon. Are you envious because I'm, gel because I'm generous? Verse five, are you envious because I'm generous, the landowner says. So it's like, can I not do with what I want? I mean, it's my money. Can I not give it to whoever I want? Can I, can I not distribute it in the way that I see fit? Or are you envious, verse 15, because I'm generous? Yeah, so it's just a life there, like a question. And of course, the, the hint is, yeah, you are, you are envious because, because, of course, the landowner represents God because God is generous to all people. I think there might be some envy there. 
Now, this is the funny thing about envy. You can be perfectly content with your life as it is until you look at or see something else that you desire and for whatever reason you can't secure it, that's when envy is going to start to creep in. I can be perfectly content with my car and my house and my belongings until I pass by the Julia Morgan house of my dreams. And it's like I want it. I want that house. Well, weren't you happy with your own place yesterday? Yeah, I was, but I just saw this. I just saw this architectural dream house. I really, really would really like that. And then suddenly you look at your own space, your own house, and like, I don't really, it's okay. It's okay. But that's, how, that's kind of how envy works. And again, we can be envious of so many different things. I wish I could be that intelligent. I wish I could be that good looking. Why can't I be as successful as this person is? I've worked just as hard. Why can't, it's always kind of looking over at something else. I'd be happy too if I had a husband like that. I'd be happy too if I had a wife like that. I'd be happy too if I had children like that or grandchildren like that or money or position or influence. You could be envious of someone's age, of someone's energy, what anything. It's a looking at what other people have in life, wanting it, then looking at your own life and suddenly becoming discontent with your own life. So whatever Peter was looking at, the day that he said to Jesus, so what is in this for us and are we going to get a little bit more than other people? Whatever it is he was looking at, he was feeling a bit discontent with his lot in life. And then Jesus goes on to tell this parable. Verse 11 in the parable, the workers grumble against the landlord. So when they get their wages at the end of the day, not the five o'clockers, they wouldn't be grumbling, right? Not the three o'clockers, but the early morning people, the workers grumbled against the landlord. The word in the original language is, I love this word, go gizzo. It's like, go gizzo, go gizzo, go gizzo. They're grumbling. This isn't fair. This isn't right. How come we, we deserve more? That's it. There's the word there. We deserve more. Well, I, I, I deserve this. It's almost like an entitlement, isn't it? I deserve this. I should have more. Um, and the parable asks, are you envious? Is that what's going on here? Is that what's going on? Envy is an interesting word in the original. It, the original Latin word is invidia, invidia, which means no sight, it means you can't see. That's the, the root word for envy in Latin. And there's a really interesting kind of creepy image in Dante's Inferno. Do you remember, did you read Dante's Inferno in college? It was Dante's picture of hell. Remember he had all the different levels of hell going down, 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 down. Well, the envious labored under a cloak of lead with their eyes sewn shut with lead wire. Isn't that creepy? It was like, that was how he was picturing the envious. This is how they would pay for it in hell. He's, Dante's imagining that they're going, they're laboring under this cloak of lead, this heaviness, and their eyes are sewn shut with lead wire. It's the idea of the image of no sight, um, a spiritual blindness, invidia, envy, lack of perspective, wrong perspective, no discernment, 
not seeing things clearly, accurately, or in the, in the right light at all. Spiritual blindness, it's all about a lack of perspective. Um, and the lack of perspective is, here's the thing, what makes me think that I would have no more unmet desires if I got my Julia Morgan house? Okay, imagine just for a minute, I did manage to secure a Julia Morgan house. It's highly unlikely, just imagine. Okay, so remember this is, it's all fantasy, it's all storytelling. Envy's all, all about fantasy. It's all about elaborate stories we tell ourselves. What makes me think if I managed to secure my Julia Morgan house that I would have no more envy? Right? And that doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, I would be happy for a while. I'm sure I would. But I'm sure in time, something else would catch my attention because that's the nature of the beast, right? That's the nature of the green-eyed monster. That's, that's the way it is. You know, I'd get the house and then I'd, I'd find something else. It's always about imagining how it would be. I remember one time I wanted this, I really wanted this call in Minneapolis, a church call. And I imagined what a great, well, it probably would have been a great church, there's no doubt about that, but in my fantasies, it was the most perfect place ever. Um, so you can imagine all sorts of things when you really want something, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's true doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate, doesn't necessarily mean that would have been a great call for me at all. I ended up not getting that call. And it just as well, because then I would never have come here. So we don't necessarily always know, do we? Uh, envy, NVIDIA, no sight, what the scripture calls spiritual blindness. Concentrating on the wrong things. Eyes sewn shut, all imagination, all one big elaborate story we tell ourselves when we start to feel a little bit discontent, we start to feel a little bit restless, and we start to look around and think, well, is this all there is? Isn't there more? And then that energy latches on to whatever catches our eye in a way. I mean, the energy's there, the discontent's there. And uh, then we just kind of look around for, and then something will, will, will take our attention, like, oh, that, oh, that's what it is. That's what I need. That's what I want. And if you've ever gone with that energy and actually tried to secure what you wanted, what you thought you needed, you'll know that it wasn't always what you thought it was going to be. In other words, the discontent and the envy after some time returned. It didn't fulfill what it promised to fulfill. Yeah, I think that's why they call them false gods. They don't, they don't, they don't keep their promises. So I think in a very, very practical level, One way to deal with envy when it arises, because for many of us it will at certain times, is simply to see it for what it is. Expose it, in other words. And this works for an awful lot of things that get us off track in our spiritual life and in our emotional life, to just expose it for what it is. So when you see yourself dreaming and making up these stories about what you think you need in order to be fulfilled, it's like you can stop yourself and, and, and remind yourself and be the voice of reason and say, that's actually not true. You know, it's about telling yourself the truth, learning how to tell yourself the truth. This is what the transformed mind that Paul speaks about. When we start to allow the Spirit of God to transform us, change us, change our minds, 
This is what it would look like. We would start to tell ourselves the truth and say, that's not really true. Now you might think it is, and you might be tempted to go down that road and try and secure that or try and work for that or dedicate your life to that, but that's not necessarily true. It's more envy, like so many other things, it's, it's more like a, a red flag. It's like a spiritual red flag that says, okay, there's an emptiness here. There's something, there's something not quite right. There's something that's missing here, which by the way, you're human. You're gonna have that. This is the plight of being human. There's nothing wrong with feeling emptiness. There's nothing wrong in being restless. There's nothing wrong in wanting more. It's more about what you do with that uh, feeling of wanting more or restlessness. You see, for Jesus, he would say, you need to get back to the source of life. You gotta make sure that you're looking in the right place. That's why Jesus would always say things like, you know, if you're empty, come to me because I'm going to meet your needs at a much deeper level. If you're thirsty, you come to me. If you're hungry, you come to me. He's talking about that spiritual thirst, that emotional thirst. He's speaking about that emptiness that we can get in life when things just aren't quite working for us at whatever level. And there, it seems to be that at certain times in our life, the things that used to work for us go through seasons where they're not working for whatever reason. And these are the times where we're, the scripture always encourages us to get back to God, to get back to the source of life. Rather than look out there and say, oh, this is what I need. Oh, that's what I need. Well, if I pursue that, that's going to fill me. It's like, no, that's eyes closed. That's not necessarily going to work. How about getting back to the source? So I want to encourage you with that this morning, especially those of you who can relate to Peter. You know, you look around and you're, you know, you're a bit like, is this it? Is this it? You feel like there's, there's something missing. Well, there is something missing. It's, <laughs> there is something missing in a way. We are empty in a way. But Jesus would say, you, got, you have to learn how to fill it with the right thing. You know, St. Paul speaks about inviting the spirit to come and fill us rather than the things of the world. So let me encourage you with that this morning and that can be a prayer. God, in all the empty places, come and fill me. Show me what is true. Give me your eyes to see things Give me your perspective. Amen.
Did you notice in our parable that the workers were paid not because they deserved it? I mean, these five o'clockers, I mean, they got paid. It wasn't really because they put a full day's work in, was it? It's, the parable was really more about God's generosity. Um, everyone got the same due to God's generosity. It's not really the way the world works, is it? It's not what we're used to. You know, Jesus would often say, um, this is the way God works. That's why I'm telling you the parable. Or he would use the line, the kingdom of God is like. It was like, this is the way God is. Um, it's undeserved generosity. God gives because that's who God is. And, and God's generosity is motivated by love. It's not motivated by our performance or if we deserve it. It's like God doesn't say, well, I'll love you if you, you know, deserve it. If you do what I want you to do. If you measure up. If you, whatever the condition is. It doesn't really work that way in the kingdom of God or in, in the way that God works toward us. Um, what or who you love, you give to. And that's the way it is with God. What or who you love, you give to. God loves us, therefore God gives. The same thing, the same principle happens in our lives. The things that are important to you, the people that are important to you, you naturally give to that one or whatever it is, or to the church. Which reminds me, I want to thank every single one of you who has helped out in any way this week, sent in your offerings, prayed for us, put your check in the mail through our letterbox, Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your support of this ministry. Every gift you give to us is a gift to God. Amen. Mm -hmm.